Today I'm gonna show you how I took my toaster oven to a whole new level. Not only making incredible looking dishes, but most importantly, absolutely delicious. I'm gonna show you how easy it is to make five-star food restaurant only using your toaster oven and nothing else. And when I say I'm talking about delicious, I mean it. This is cooking every meat only using my toaster oven. So let's do it. And the first one we're gonna start off is a filet mignon. This is one of the most popular steaks in the world. A lot of people claim there is not a lot of flavor and they are actually right. But even though it does lack some flavor, it makes it up with tenderness. This is the most tender part of the cow and by far one of the most popular steak in every steakhouse there is. The first thing I like to do is to coat it with a nice high heat oil. This will ensure that my seasoning will stick. I'm using grapeseed oil and I definitely recommend it. Talking about seasoning, I started with a good amount of salt, freshly ground black pepper and of course garlic powder. At least to me that is the best way to season a steak. Especially when you're using a delicious tender cut of meat like this, you don't want to go crazy. Now here's the thing with a toaster oven. Now what I'm gonna do is challenge myself not to use anything but the toaster oven through this entire video. Now I do want to get some searing on this beautiful steak and I know if I put my steak there in the toaster oven at high temperature to sear it, it will also start cooking it. I could use a torch and I definitely recommend you getting one if you don't have one. But hey, that would just be not fair because we all know that already works and that's not going to be a challenge. So I went to my next best thing which is a cast iron pan and I put it in my oven at 500 degrees Fahrenheit to heat that up. And my thought behind it is that the cast iron will keep its heat so hopefully that will be enough to sear the steak. So after about 10 minutes in the oven I took it out and I immediately pour in my steak. Now you gotta hold it there for at least a minute and a half. If not, it's not gonna do anything. And after the time was up, this is what I got. As you can see, it kind of worked, but not perfectly. So I quickly heat up the pan once again, and then I tried it one more time. And after the time was up, this is what I got. I'm a huge fan of a crust, but hey, that's not bad. I like that. So once I knew it actually worked, I did the same thing on the other side. And as you can see, I got a nice, beautiful sear. The next thing to do is to put it in the oven at 250 degrees Fahrenheit height until I reach an internal temperature of 135 which will give me a medium rare. Since now I have 30 minutes I decided to come up with a simple sauce that anyone can use for their filet mignon at home. And the first thing I did was to melt some butter inside of the oven. Then I added a little bit of garlic paste followed by a pinch of Dijon mustard and of course heavy cream. Using the residual heat of the actual melted butter I was able to mix all the ingredients together. As you can see after stirring it for quite a bit it became a nice sauce and I was super pumped for that. That. To finish off the sauce, I threw in a little bit of black pepper, mix it well, and there we have it. A sauce without actually any pan. That is amazing. If you live somewhere that you don't have access to a stove, there you go. The next thing to do is to put it in the oven and let it heat up with my steak. Even though I thought it was gonna take only 30 minutes for my steak, I was totally wrong. At the end, it was 46 minutes and it was cooked to a perfectly medium rare to 135 degrees Fahrenheit. Then I went ahead and threw in my sauce. Oh yes, my friends, that is just mouth-watering already. To finish it up, I threw in a little bit of chives and it's time to slice it open. It's perfectly medium rare and exactly what I was looking for. Let me remind you, this was done in a toaster oven. And when I took my first bite, oh, it's so juicy, buttery. The combination of the juices from the actual steak and the sauce is incredible. And just in case you are wondering, I finished all of it. The next one is gonna be a beautiful Florida lobster. And this one, folks, is as easy as it gets. And if you are ever intimidated how to cook lobster, you shouldn't. This is how to do it. I am using Florida lobster tail. However, if you have main available, it should work just as good. To make a nice, beautiful presentation, the first thing I like to do is to remove all the flappers. This is definitely not necessary, but it makes a beautiful presentation at the end, and I recommend it if you have the time. The next thing you wanna do is to cut it open right in the middle. Using the scissor makes the job really easy. Just cut the shell until you get almost towards the end. Now, using your hand, carefully you open it up. As you can see, my lobster is still kind of frozen, and that's exactly what you wanna do with seafood keep it as cold as possible, especially if they are not fresh. By the time I was done, this is what it looks like. We just gotta lay the meat right on top of the shell. That will give you a beautiful presentation at the end, just like they do it in the restaurants. Then I jumped right into the seasoning, and for that, I used a little bit of salt and freshly ground black pepper, nothing else. Then I transferred it to a cooling rack to make sure the heat goes all the way around. If you put it directly on the tray, you will prevent the shell from becoming red. And if you're looking for presentation, that's definitely something you gotta watch out 
before. Now one of the great things that goes together with lobster is lemon. So I add them to the tray and put them in the oven at my highest setting on my broiler, which actually was at 500 degrees Fahrenheit for 10 minutes. You are looking for an internal temperature of 140 degrees Fahrenheit. That will give you a perfect doneness for your lobster. And of course, we all know that butter and lobster is the perfect marriage. So after melting a little bit of butter, I threw in some garlic paste and smoked paprika. Mixed everything well and my butter sauce was ready for my lobster. After 10 minutes, you can clearly see the shell changing color and also the lobster becoming from translucent to a solid white. Once that's done, you know your lobster is fully cooked. The next thing to do is to first base it with that lemon. And don't be shy, my friends. Because the lemon was cooked, it's now sweeter. And I recommend throwing the whole thing at it. Once that was done, of course, we gotta go in with our butter. Oh, come on. That is what I'm talking about. Like everybody says, butter makes everything better and that is absolutely true. To give some color and smoky flavor, I threw in a little bit of smoked paprika. And of course, always add more butter. There's no way you would ever guess that it was done completely in a toaster oven. I will take that any day. But now for my favorite part, which is the tasting. And if you cooked everything correctly, check it out. You don't even need a knife. That is what we're looking for, my friends. It's so soft and tender and very far away from being rubbery. And after I took my first bite, oh, come on. That is amazing. It is incredible. I couldn't wait to go for the second one. It's just so tender and juicy and sweet. Adding the lemon and smothering it on butter, oh man, it just takes in a whole new level. It is very difficult to make any lobster better than this. I'm telling you, my friends, this is amazing and I definitely recommend you giving it a try. Now let's move into pork belly and can you hear that crunch? Yes, that's exactly what we're always looking for when we're making pork belly. And once you know the secret how to do it, it's easy. And I'm going to share with you how I get perfect results every time. And here's how to make it. And of course, we start off with the pork belly. Always look for ones that have the most amount of meat. Because by default, it already has plenty of fat. And one of the things that it's always lacking is meat. In this case, and this case only, less fat is actually better. Also, it is a requirement to have the skin on. Without the skin, it's just a no-go. The first thing to do is to scrape the skin as much as possible with a paring knife. This will help take out any moisture there is on the surface. And check it out. This is exactly what you're looking for. Make sure you scrape that off as much as possible. Then you want to use a meat tenderizer, or if you don't have one, you can also use a fork. What you're really trying to do is to poke some holes to allow the moistures to escape. And as you can see, after I did that, Check out all that moisture. That is exactly what you're looking for. The less moisture, the more crispy your pork belly will be. After wiping it off with a paper towel, the next thing to do is to make a boat. Let me explain a little better. Using an aluminum foil, place your pork belly right on top. Fold the edges until you have at least half an inch of clearance. At the same time, make sure everything is tight. Then you want to cover the whole thing with kosher salt. It is important that you do not use table salt because it's too fine. And instead of pulling the moisture out, which is what we want, you are actually going to make it salty. You can either use kosher salt or rock salt. By the time you're done, this is what you're looking for. Now place it in your refrigerator for a total of 12 hours. Or better yet, overnight. Once the time is up, pull it out of the refrigerator and remove all of the salt. As you can see, a lot of the moisture was extracted by the salt. And that is exactly what we're looking for. Check it out. You can automatically tell that it's a different color. That is a sign that the salt did its job. Now, I know it seems redundant, but once again, you gotta make a new boat. No, you cannot use the same one you just did because the structure will be compromised. So you have to make a new boat. And when we're done, we're gonna repeat the process one more time and that's to fill it up everything with salt. Make sure you have the whole thing covered, including the edges. Set your toaster oven to 350 degrees Fahrenheit for one hour. Put it on the lowest rack and let it cook. We want to render that fat as much as we can. Once the one hour was up, this is what I got. As you can see, the salt once again did its job. It almost pulled out all of the moisture from the skin. Now you gotta make sure you remove all of the salt. You don't want any of that in your actual pork belly. If not, it's gonna be way too salty. And check out that render pork fat. Now here's where that salt comes in. Mix that together with your pork fat and it will make an amazing seasoning salt for you to season anything you want. I just love it with beans. It is incredible. Don't throw your salt away, my friends. It will bring incredible flavors to many different dishes. The next step is to put it on a cooling 
cooking rack to let it cook. Once again, make sure you take out all of that salt. As you can see, the skin already started to bubble up a little bit. That is a good sign. Set your oven to broil at its highest setting. Throw it in the oven so you can do its job. It usually takes about 10 minutes, so keep an eye on it. Because we have a little bit of time, I decided to make a dipping sauce, and here's how. I started with 5 tablespoons of soy sauce, followed by 2 tablespoons of ponzu sauce, 1 tablespoon of red white vinegar, 1 teaspoon of sesame oil, and half a tablespoon of chili oil. To finish it off, I threw in green onions, and to dilute the flavor a little bit, about 2 tablespoons of water. Mix everything well, and your dipping sauce is done. I'm telling you, friends, this is incredible. And to pair it up with our pork belly is just perfect. Talking about pork belly, it's time to check it. And as you can see, the toaster oven is doing its job. And at the very last moment, you're gonna see a mountain coming up. That is a sign that everything is working exactly as it should. The skin is separating from the meat and the fat, and it's actually frying the inside out. That is how you get that incredible crackling that we all love. And after exactly 10 minutes, check it out. This, friends, must be one of the easiest things that you can make on your toaster oven. It is all about technique. If you do everything the same exactly I did, you will have the same results. And I'll tell you one thing, all of your family will thank you later. Now the only thing left to do is to cut it open but first, I'm gonna let you hear this once again. <laughs> I don't have to tell you it's crunchy, do I? Check out my bite. That is absolutely phenomenal. It is not too salty if you're thinking that the salt penetrated too much, absolutely not. It is crunchy, delicious, fatty at the same time, juicy, but hey, that's just the beginning. We still have the actual meat. And check that out, my friends, you tell me. That is phenomenal. Now to make it even better is to dip it in the dipping sauce and wow, come on. That should be illegal. It's too good. Crunchy, fatty, salty, just basically melt in your mouth and then the crunch hits you my friends please try this one at home it is not hard to make and it's also extremely affordable get yourself some pork belly and enjoy now the next thing we're gonna cook is a wreck of lamb and it's gonna be juicy tender and absolutely delicious and here's how to make it I started by preheating my oven to 500 degrees Fahrenheit threw in my cast iron in there because you know exactly the reason why it will help me put a beautiful sear and this is our wreck of lamb this one is domestic lamb and it already comes Frenched French basically means that the bones are all clean as you can see right here. The wonderful thing about getting them Frenched and butchered is that you don't have to do all the work. But now the first thing I like to do is to score the fat. And what this does is to help it render. Trust me, render fat tastes amazing. And hopefully the toaster oven is gonna do an amazing job. But once I was done with the scoring, check it out. This is exactly what you're looking for. Now as I mentioned before, if you only have a toaster oven, you should definitely try to get a torch. This will be an awesome tool for you to use for charring. It's also very affordable and cheap that you can use for many different things. But hey, today we're gonna go with our cast iron. Now since you know my cast iron is quite small, it's not gonna fit on this one. I mean, it fits on this big one here, but hey, that's not gonna fit in my toaster oven. So I took my rack of lamb and decided to cut it in half. And here's a tip, whenever you're cutting it, make sure to put it fat side down. That way you can see the bone and it will be easy to cut. Now just like the steak, I'm coating it with grapeseed oil. This is a high temperature oil because I wanna make sure that my cast iron is hot and gives it a nice sear. Make sure to coat it all the way around so that the seasoning will stick. Talking about that, I first started with salt, black pepper, garlic powder, and smoked paprika. Remember to season all sides, including the edges. Even though it's not a very large piece of meat, the seasoning is always important. After 10 minutes, I quickly removed the cast iron out and started to sear the lamb. And as you can see, the fat just starts rendering right away. I was not quite sure that this was gonna work, but once I turned it around, check it out. Yes, it works like a charm, everybody. Body. You can make incredible food with only our toaster oven, nothing else. Now since we know it works great, the next thing I did is to sear everything. And by the time I was done, check that out. It's not charcoal, but hey, it's still good for a toaster oven, come on. You gotta give me some credit. Even though it looks ready, trust me, it's still raw in the middle. So the next thing is to transfer it to a cooling rack so that the air can circulate all the way around my oven. I set it to bake at 250 degrees Fahrenheit for 30 minutes. I was shooting for an internal temperature of 100 135 degrees Fahrenheit. And since it was cooking, it gave me time to make an amazing crust. So I started off by chopping up some Parmesan cheese. If you can, use the real deal. And I'm talking about Parmigiano Reggiano from 
immediately. It's just better. The next ingredient for our crust is fried onions. I've already shown how to make them and it's super easy to do. If you have not seen that video, I'll make sure to link it on the video in the description down below. The next thing is to add everything to your food processor, starting by the cheese, followed by a little bit of parsley, the fried onions, and blend everything on high. Make sure you pulverize everything. Once that's done, I season it with smoked paprika, black pepper, and finished it off with a good olive oil. Blend everything once again on high and your crust is done. This friends taste absolutely incredible. I mean, you already know the ingredients so you can imagine what it tastes like. By the time I was done with my crust, my rack of lamb reached an internal temperature of 135 degrees Fahrenheit. Pulled that out of the oven and this is what they look like. As you can see, the fat caramelized a little bit more and that was perfect. As it's still hot, I added Dijon mustard. It not only added additional flavor, but it's also a great binder for my crust. Now the only thing left to do is to add the crust and add as much as you like. Some people like it with more and some people like it with less. Now you have two options with your lamb. If you like it rare, this is what it looks like. As I mentioned, this doneness is at 135 degrees Fahrenheit. As you can see, it is extremely juicy. After doing a poll on my Instagram, many people say that it's way too raw. Yes, it's kind of rare, but at the same time, by no means is it raw. But hey, the important thing is the taste and when I took my first bite, whoa. <laughs> That is amazing! Yes, it's rare, but come on! That is amazing! I had to really restrain myself not to eating the whole thing. I totally understand why a lot of people like it this way. Remember, it's cooked at 135 degrees Fahrenheit. And as you can see, I couldn't stop eating it. It was so good. But after putting it in the oven and taking it to 150 degrees Fahrenheit, this is what I got. As you can see, even the crust got a little caramelization. That cheese completely melted. So I'm pretty sure a lot of you will like this one. And this is what you're lamb will look like at 150 degrees Fahrenheit. Check that out friends, that is juicy. <laughs> this is killing me because I'm not quite sure which one is better. Even though it was cooked to 150 degrees Fahrenheit, the juiciness is absolutely insane. I would say now that it's kind of like medium rare to medium. And when I took my first bite, <laughs> it is incredible. I don't know if it's just me that I'm a lamb lover or whatever it is, it tastes absolutely phenomenal. Check out the juiciness. Oh boy, come on. I'll tell you one thing, it was difficult for me to stop eating it. So now that you know both temperatures, 135 and 150, pick whichever one you like. They are both phenomenal and I love them both. And one last thing you should know about the lamb is that I ate all of it because it was just way too good. The next thing we're gonna do, a lot of people call it meatballs, but me and my family, we call it meat cake. And we call it that because they're not round. But even though they don't look like a sphere, I'll tell you one thing, they are the best I've ever had. And here's how to make them. The first thing to do is to soak some bread. I like to use brioche buns. Why? Because it has a good amount of fat. You can use regular white bread, but brioche buns will be better. You wanna soak them in whole milk. And when I say soak, I mean it. For my ground beef, I'm using 80-20. As you know, 80% lean and 20% fat. Then I threw in one whole egg, followed by some parsley, pecorino cheese, ricotta, garlic paste, the soaked bread, black pepper, and salt. Now remember, exact amount and ingredients always on the description down below for you. Mix it well and combine all those ingredients together. And when I say mix it well, I mean it. You want to treat it almost like a dough. Mix that thing as much as you can. And if you are wondering if you can make everything in your food processor, yes, you can. I just didn't want to make mine dirty. But after you mix everything and you mix it once again, this is what I got. This meat dough has a tremendous amount of moisture and that's what's gonna make your meat cake extremely juicy. Check out the consistency. It's almost impossible to hold it together. That's why we don't call them meatballs because by the end, they won't have a sphere shape. To mold them in your hand, you gotta use both hands. Do not try to squish them. Just mold them slightly little by little. You are actually looking for crevices in between the meat. It allows the fat to render and just basically baste itself. And forget about having a perfect sphere shape. There's no need. By the time I was done, this is what I got. As you can see, none of them look like a ball, and that's why we call them meat cake. Trust me friends, they are way better than meatballs. The next thing to do is to stick them in the oven at 425 degrees Fahrenheit for 25 minutes. And that gives us time to make a little sauce. My tomato sauce is pretty simple. It's a combination of tomatoes, garlic, shallots, and a little bit of basil. I have done several videos about this before, and if you have not seen it, I'll make sure to put it in the description down below for you. But going back to our meat cakes, check it out. Look how juicy that is. And once the 25 minutes were up, I took them out of the oven, and this is what they 
they look like? Yep, I know exactly what you're thinking. That doesn't look that appetizing, but wait until you take a bite. I can guarantee you, you will fall in love. The next thing to do is to plate them. Throw in a little bit of that sauce, followed by parsley, and finished it off with grated pecorino cheese. That, my friends, is Guga's meat cake. Forget about meatloaf. Make this. Yes, it is not meatballs, but it is better. It is so good. Juicy to the max. Flavorful. There's so many flavors that it's difficult to tell. And the best part is that it is extremely affordable. And you might already have every single ingredient at home. The only thing you gotta remember about these meat cakes is that they are extremely addicting. And I can guarantee you every plate will be cleaned. In my household, certainly was. Now I'm gonna show you my take on toaster oven short rib. And it is so easy to make, but at the same time, it's something that you're gonna crave after you make it once. The first thing we gotta do is to cut up some vegetables. And we're gonna do something that is called mirepoix. It's a combination of carrots, onion, and celery. The only important thing to keep in mind is to try to keep them all at the same size. And this is the star of the show. It is a two-bone short rib. As you can see, there's still a little bit of silver skin on the top. To remove it, it's pretty straightforward, just get a fillet knife and go right underneath it. Try not to remove any of the meat, we're only looking to take out the silver skin, nothing else. But once I was done, it was ready for the seasoning. Talking about that, I have a special ingredient. This is umami powder, and if you are unfamiliar with umami, it is basically your fifth taste. We all taste bitter, sour, sweet, salty, and the very last one, umami. And if you've never had this, I definitely recommend it. Here's what it looks like. It's like little pellets. I know it looks funny because it's made out of mushrooms and all that, but it tastes incredible in meat. And it is one of my secrets for this short rib. So I started by seasoning with salt, freshly ground black pepper, and garlic powder. Rub it against your board and make sure you season all sides, including the edges. Now the only thing left to do is to add the umami powder so that the osmosis process can begin. And basically what that means is that the salt will extract moisture from the meat. And that moisture will combine with the umami powder. And then we'll go right back into the meat. And I'll show you that very shortly. To braise the short rib, I'm gonna be using this little mini cast iron. It's perfect for this application. So I started by throwing in all my vegetables inside. Mix them well and throw in tomato paste. By adding the tomato paste, it will help you make an incredible sauce. And for this braised short rib, it is the key. Once everything has been mixed together, throw in red wine. A good amount. Now this, friends, is called demi-glaze. You can make it at home or you can buy little packages like this. And since we're doing easy toaster oven recipes, I think this one is perfect for this application. Demi-glaze will take you two to three days to make. It is better to make it at home, but this is the second best thing. Now mix everything well and combine all of those ingredients together. Throw it into your oven at 250 degrees Fahrenheit for 10 minutes. And the reason you wanna throw it into the oven for 10 minutes is so that you can burn off a little bit of that alcohol. If you don't do it, your sauce will not taste that good. After 10 minutes in the oven, I took it off and it was ready. If there's any caramelization in the edges, just make sure you take it off with the vegetables. But after about 15 minutes, check out the meat. And look what happened with our umami powder. That is osmosis. The salt is almost gone and the umami powder is starting to penetrate deeply into the meat. But now all there's left to do is to put the meat back in my Dutch oven and cover it up. I'm gonna be cooking it at 250 degrees Fahrenheit for a total of two hours. That will make a nice tender short rib. After two hours, this is what I got. It is now nice and tender, but at the same time, we don't have any caramelization. But we can fix that real quick. So I took it off, put it on my tray, and set my oven at 500 degrees Fahrenheit for five minutes. That will definitely get the job done. It also gave me time to go back to my sauce and strain it. And once I did, friends, I was left with liquid gold. By roasting the vegetables, mixing it with the demi-glaze and wine, it tastes incredible. I almost said forget about the short rib, I just want to drink this. I think this is the whole key of this entire dish. But hey, after 5 minutes, my meat was ready. I quickly took it out of the oven and placed it on a bed of sweet corn and parsley. And of course, we added that sauce. I'm telling you right now, the whole key of this entire thing is the sauce. The short rib is really good, but the sauce is everything. This is something I can eat every day. And when I tell you to smother the whole thing in the sauce, I mean it. It is so flavorful. The vegetables roasting give an incredible taste. This is probably one of my top picks today. And even though it does take a little bit of time, it's so rewarding. It is something that you should definitely give it a try. Of course, try to make more than just one, even if it's not on your toaster oven. It's something that all your entire family will love. Mine certainly did. And of course, we cannot forget about chicken wings. I think for a toaster oven, it's perfect. 
And who doesn't like some amazing chicken wings? And I'm gonna show you a trick how to get them real crispy. And here's how. We started off with eight chicken wings. Now there's a huge debate if you like the drums or if you like the other ones better. Whichever one you like, it does not matter. Chicken wings are amazing and they're always good. And this is my secret to making crispy chicken wings. It's baking powder. It will give you more surface area and if you do it right, it will be as crispy as fried. So I threw in my chicken wings on the bowl and coated them with the baking powder. You want to make sure every single one of them get cold nicely. So by the time you're done cooking them, they'll be nice and crispy. Next thing to do is to lay them on a cooling rack so that they can dry overnight on your refrigerator. That will pull moisture out. And we already know the enemy of crispy, crispy skin is moisture. And by removing that moisture, it will be as crispy as fried. So into the refrigerator they go for 24 hours. The very next day, this is what they look like. Check that out. It is as dry as it gets. So you already know this thing is gonna be crispy. I set my oven to bake at 450 degrees Fahrenheit for 30 minutes. That is enough time to cook them and get them crispy. Now you can just use regular star hot sauce and it will work just great. But I like to make my own sauce and let me show you how. I started by melting some butter. Then I threw in a good amount of Louisiana hot sauce. You could use sriracha or any other type of hot sauce that you like. To have this Asian twist, I threw in some panzu sauce followed by ketchup menace, which is basically a sweet soy sauce. Now all there's left to do is to mix everything well and combine all the ingredients. And once that's done, your sauce is ready. Check it out, everybody. It's sweet, spicy, and the taste is phenomenal. But now going back to our chicken wings. At half point, it is important to flip them. That way, it will ensure that all the skin get nice and crispy. Now just in case you are wondering, you're shooting for an internal temperature of 165 degrees Fahrenheit. And just like the pork belly, check that out. The skin is separating from the meat and you already know the results of that when that happens. But once the time was up, this is what I got. These are chicken wings made in the toaster oven. They are just as crispy as deep fried. Now all there's left to do is to sauce them and make sure you put plenty of it because that sauce is incredible. Don't believe me, after saucing them, I even threw them back into the pan to make sure I got plenty of sauce. That sauce is just phenomenal. To finish them off, I threw in a little bit of chives followed by sesame seeds and my chicken wings were done. Now all there's left to do is to give them a try and check that out. When I took my first bite, <laughs> Yes, super tender pull off the bone, as crispy as it gets. That sauce is just phenomenal. I'm telling you friends, these are amazing chicken wings. I just wish I can have some more right now. That is all the meat I currently have in my house. I cooked everything everybody, all in the toaster oven and every single one of them turned out fantastic. We are in self-quarantine, which because we're listening to the government officials. I hope you guys are doing the same as well, staying safe at home. I need to place a new uh, order with my meat supplier because I have no more meat left in my freezer. Emilio, shout out to you. Anyway, guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you do enjoy it, make sure to give it a thumbs up. If you're not a subscriber, be sure to subscribe for future videos. Remember, if you are interested in anything I use, everything is always in the description down below. Thank you. So so much for watching and we'll see you guys on the next one. Let me know in the comments below what you would like me to cook next on my toaster oven everybody. Sometimes those little things does amazing dishes. Stay safe, stay home, keep cooking. If you keep cooking, I will. See you guys on the next one. Take care everybody. Bye bye.